Scott, we spoke to you, I think, in 2014, right around the time of the release of your book, uh, Writing for the Green Light. Mm -hmm. So it's 2017 right now. What have you been up to these past few years? Uh, at that time, I was working with Mar Vista Entertainment, um, and I actually uh, moved away from them and I joined a new company. So I'm now working with a company that's UK based called DRG. Uh, they're actually owned by a Scandinavian entity called Modern Times Group, which owns 30, 40 production companies all over Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, um, and we manage a lot of their, you know, the distribution of that content. Uh, but because DRG is UK based, they have great relationships with a lot of UK production companies, distributors, uh, broadcasters like BBC, Channel 4. So we do a lot of uh, distribution of that content. And then we do some major co-production deals with uh, US entities like AMC Networks, Nat Geo, et cetera. So it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. And I'm actually working on a new book that's kind of same idea as writing for the green light, much more distribution focused to kind of give people a really uh, uh, simplified, uh, easy to digest way of understanding some of the, the more granular complexities of the distribution business in a way that's kind of applicable to being a filmmaker, a producer, or a writer, so. What are your day-to-day -day activities uh, and who are you interacting with during the week for your new venture or your new role? Um, so what I do with DRG is I cover, uh, I basically manage business development and the sale of media content uh, from the UK office into North America. So actually I'm one of very few Americans that work for the company. It's really much more European based. Um, but they wanted an American kind of in LA on the ground who could represent their interests, help them develop and grow and get a strong foothold into the United States. Um, because this is by far the biggest media market in the world. So um, being able to get direct sure. access to the big players, the, the, the major networks here, the, the major digital players, et cetera, being able to uh, have somebody in town who can have that direct you know, communication was very important for them. So I handled the the day-to-day -day sales of content, the finished content or the completed stuff. Um, I help work on development deals of putting together new media content. Um, and I also do what are called format deals. Uh, format deals are when you take, let's say an international show, something like a big one, like Shameless. Um, when that gets reproduced in North America, um, it's called a format. It's, it's you're taking the format of the original show and making an American adaptation. So that's, you know, American Idol is a format. The Voice is a format. It's a replicable type program. So we do a lot of format deals too. Uh, and I also cover Latin America too, in the same capacity. Who are some of the people you're interacting with on a daily basis? Um, primarily who I work with, uh, you, you know, it's gonna be acquisitions executives at the major networks. It's going to be acquisition executives with the major digital platforms like Hulu, Netflix, um, and basically I'm having you know direct conversations with them, finding out what their content strategies are going to be for the channel, for the platform, uh, and helping to use the library that we have at DRG to um, help them with their content goals. Uh, so I, you know, I'm on the phone, I'm, you know, doing emails uh, in terms of getting our content in front of the right people and then helping to broker those deals. And then once those deals come together, you know, communicating with our London-based office and our business affairs team, accounting uh, materials, and brokering that whole process out. So most of the content is overseas. It's, you said, like Eastern European or the UK-based uh, filmmaking? A lot of it. And because we do a lot of co-productions, for instance, like when, when we do um, a co-production with AMC Networks, you know, they're obviously U.S. based. So generally in that deal, the money they're putting down is because they have a strong, uh, uh, you know, placement in the United States. They have strong output in the United States. They have a channel. They have a lot of, you know, uh, different avenues they can exploit the content on. So they'll want to hold on to the United States or North America's whole U.S. and, and Canada. And we'll get the rest of the world. Um, the reverse flip of that is, yeah, when we have international deals, HBO Europe deals, um, or you know some other major network internationally, that produced content that's either in a foreign language, or is you know English but with an accent like Australian or or British, um, yeah, we'll take that and we'll bring that to the U.S. Of the content that is non-U.S. based, what do you find sells here the most? What what types of stories? What types of genres? Um, 
you know, in truth, it ends up sort of being the same type of stuff that works globally. You know, people like entertainment, people like uh, uh, strong characters, interesting, uh, you know, just interesting experiences that we want to pull from media in, in a nutshell. What works the best that we have access to, because Modern Times Group, our parent company is uh, Scandinavian based, we have a great relationship with a lot of the major Nordic uh, television producers like NRK, it's the biggest channel in Norway, for instance, and they produce amazing content. They produce these television series that are called Nordic Noirs, and they're these very dark, bleak, uh, very fascinating, um, very rich textured stories. Um, we have several of them. We have a series called Nobel, uh, which you know we've done a, a global exclusive with uh, Netflix on, not global exclusive, multi-territory exclusive with Netflix on. We did. Uh, 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 you know, we, we have a brand new one called Monster that I just closed a, a, a great deal of stars on. So that's going to be broadcasting at the end of the year. Um, these are films in a foreign language, I'm sorry, series in a foreign language that have great placement, not just in the United States, but around the world. So almost Bergman-esque, sort of like, you know, Ingmar Bergman's films translated so well here as well, even though some of them you require, Yeah, you know. like, you know, uh, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Mm -hmm. That was based on... Uh, a Scandinavian book that has the exact same feel, style that these Nordic Noirs have. Um, and the same reason that book got adapted into a major motion picture in the United States is the same reason why the series that get produced out of Norway do very well uh, on television here but also in the, in the digital space as well. They're just great stories, they're very unique to that region of the world and they don't really get replicated easily. It's kind of how you know, in Korea, they make, the Koreans and the Japanese in general make amazing horror films. They make these great, uh, deeply kind of pieced together, interesting, paced, they're paced differently in Asia, and it has a totally different feel for the audience. And they also, the Koreans especially, there's, there's amazing television that comes out of Korea. Um, so there's great opportunities, in truth. Uh, sourcing media content from the international world and bringing it to the United States. Look at telenovelas. Telenovelas are massive. There's, like, it's, it's actually difficult for me when I'm taking a finished UK series or a, a completed Scandinavian series and then selling that into Latin America because generally, Europe, they produce six, eight episodes of a show. Here in North America, we're used to 13, 15 as, as a single season. And in Latin America and Mexico, uh, Colombia, some of the big production entities down there, they're, they're used to like 26 or more episodes for a single season. Um, so it's, it's a different level of, of content. They, they treat it differently. So telenovelas, they have hundreds of episodes. And then they can sell that same content into places like the Middle East, into Turkey, where people on screen kind of look the same, and it's going to get dubbed anyway or subtitled anyway. So it's volumes of content, it already has an audience, it's, it's built in, it's great for TV, and it's going to get dubbed anyway, and it's, it's a great opportunity to do a deal. We don't have any telenovelas at, at DRG, oh, uh, awesome. but uh, uh, a lot of companies I know that do, um, they do extraordinarily well with that type of genre. A lot of our viewers ask about pitch meetings and how to acquire one. How does someone get a pitch meeting at your company? Well, DRG is a bit different, um, where you know, we're mostly co-producing with major networks or major production companies. Um, so there's already kind of an established relationship there. And I guess that's sort of the key point in terms of how do you begin that process? How, how does one open the door to get that kind of open communication with an acquisitions team or development team? So not just a DRG, but any company, um, you kind of have to understand what that company wants, what they work with, what they like to, uh, you know, what genres of content they like to work with, uh, what, what, getting a sense of like who their kind of key clients are. You know, for instance, um, at DRG, we work a great deal with, uh, uh, you know, Netflix. We work a great deal with uh, RLJ, Acorn. We work, you know, there's specific networks that we have great relationships with. When I was at Mar Vista, we had great relationships with Lifetime, uh, Disney, Nickelodeon. So we would 
at Mar Vista, we were producing content that was kind of catered towards those audiences, um, Ion Networks and a few others. And uh, uh, at DRG, we have a different set of companies that we work closely with, that we just have a library of media that works well with those. So our acquisitions team has a different mandate than what the acquisitions team at, DR that, at Mar Vista had. And so if you're going to go into a company and attempt to build that kind of you know, initial let's see if some of my ideas are going to work well and we can get something going, uh, you have to first understand what that company does, what it is they like to work with, um, what media they're actually in need of, and then the best way to get a pitch meeting is to poise your kind of introduction as a way of being able to serve their needs, to help them accomplish their content goals. So like, you know, if, if they're looking for women in peril films, that they're looking for, uh, you know, action films. You going into those companies, pitching those two scripts are going to be great. If you, if you go in pitching stuff that has nothing to do with their core values of the company in terms of what they are, are identified with in the marketplace, you're not going to get a warm reception. It would probably, I mean, it's just they're looking for ways to satisfy uh, finding the content that they need. So if you can position yourself where you're kind of answering to that need, it's the best way to get it. I know with Mar Vista, we talked about the gold mine genre, yeah. and it was women in peril or, or tween comedies or things like that, yeah. those, things that were maybe lighter. It sounds like with um, DRG, maybe that some of the darker things like the Norwegian noir is more acceptable. So it really depends, again, what you're saying, on, on finding out what, what they represent and, and going to that. So maybe a tween comedy wouldn't work. For, tween, uh, for DRG, a tween comedy wouldn't work at all. Okay. Two mm -hmm. years ago when I was at Mar Vista, uh, you know, I would have jumped up and down if you gave me an opportunity. It's, it's because the mandate <laughs> right. of the company is different. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, right. there's just a different need. And in addition to dark Nordic noirs and you know, other deep, serious scripted content, uh, we also have a great deal of, of one-off factual films. You know, this is stuff at Mar Vista that would never work, but we have a massive library of like one-hour documentary type programs um, that do amazing in the digital space. We have a great collection of game show formats. We have, uh, you know, a great collection of like, we call it lifestyle programming, where it's like cooking and, you know, DIY type stuff. Uh, you know, it's a totally different library. Every company has a completely different package that they're selling to the marketplace. Distribution companies, to be successful, they need to be kind of branded as one thing or another. And because, you know, because they're kind of branded that way, it attracts certain types of buyers from the international marketplace. There's only so many channels in the world, there's only so many media buyers in the world, and they all have limited budgets. So you have to kind of, distribution companies have to position themselves to be different in the marketplace. And so they develop a, a kind of streamlined system of this content works really well, and because we're able to transact on it easily, let's get more of that. That's kind of how they think. So to go in, not just a pitch meeting, but if you want to showcase your script, if you want to be a producer and, and you know, uh, produce content and have it, you know, get hired by a company to produce content for them, you have to be able to position yourself to that company to say, I already do stuff like that, therefore I can help you out. You know what I mean? Right. So almost like back engineer it where a filmmaker knows that their film fits into this category and then see who has distribution that's similar to their film. Exactly. But then can they just call up? You said that that's already established relationships. I'm just curious. That's interesting. If I was a filmmaker and, and had, a let's say, a, a, a noir thr thriller that I wanted to have you know looked at, um, it sounds like that's not the channel, that's not the proper way to go about it in terms of me. Reverse engineering is exactly the way to do it. It's just if you have, if you already have a script, if you already have um, um, a film, or if you just have an idea like a treatment or anything along those lines that you're trying to get out into the marketplace, first off, if you're only at a treatment stage, I would try to package it or, or you know, get some other elements in there. But, but going to a distributor, uh, that is in alignment with whatever project you're trying to pitch. That's how you begin that introduction of this is how we can start that process of, uh, you know, being regular in regular conversation about this topic and potentially future ones. It's walking in the door by reverse engineering it in the sense of I know this company works in these two genres or three genres. My project fits that very, very well. Focusing on the companies that fit that 
and then talking to them, basically saying, look, I know you produce this stuff, or I know you develop or co-produce this kind of material. I have something very much in alignment with it. Maybe we can talk about it. And if it's at an early stage, like a treatment or, you know, just initial, you know, rough draft screenplay type thing, going to them early and kind of saying, I want to cater this for you, give me your advice or your feedback, or even better, if you're a producer, hey, I, I want to produce this, you know, woman in peril thriller, I want to produce this tween comedy, going to a company that works in that and saying, I'm going to produce it, I'm going to fund it, I'm going to figure out how to get the money for it, what I want from you is a uh, clear understanding of what works, what's going to make it a, a great film in the marketplace or a great product in the marketplace. And if, you know, in, in exchange for that, I'd love for you to be, have a first look at acquiring it later. You know, that way, or even trying to sign a deal where they get the opportunity to have it regardless. And then they're now, they have something at the back end. They have a filmmaker who's going to produce the whole thing and they get to coach and create the exact movie they want. Um, and they're guaranteed to have it at the end of the day. You know, like that's kind of how you do it. You create opportunities for the production companies or for distribution companies that make their job easier. And is someone just calling up and finding the right contact? I mean, like I'm sure it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a delicate process in getting that introduction because the filmmaker doesn't want to come off too pushy, doesn't want to send an email that's just too much information. What's what's the proper way to kind of just ease in just a little bit, n n not you know with a lot of expectation, not with too much pressure on the other person? Uh, I find LinkedIn is a great source um, because everyone in the professional world is on there, and uh, you look for terms like acquisitions. Um, anyone in the acquisitions department of a distribution company or executive producers who work for production companies, um, those are sort of the individuals tasked with making things happen, bringing stuff in. Um, and I wouldn't, if you're going to be jumping out to people um, blindly, they get a lot of people hounding them all the time. So that's kind of why I go back to you can't look at it as what can you do for me and how can you help me make my movie. You have to say, I understand your company is looking for material like this and I would like to help you with your search. If you, if you back engineer it in that sense, you are, help, you are making their job easier, you're helping them achieve a goal that's going to help them professionally and now all of a sudden they're gonna be a lot more receptive to listening to you and you position yourself differently than all the other noise that's out there. That's kind of how you do it. And from that, you know, don't make the mistake of going after the top dog at every company. You know, like don't go after the CEO or the head of this or the executive VP of that because they are bombarded with work all the time and that's just within the company, that's not, you know, you know, random people reaching out. Um, so go for juniors, go for middle managers, go for people in companies who are hungry, who have more open time, and who are looking for those opportunities to bring stuff in because it helps them also professionally achieve that next level in the company. Since writing for the Green Light, which was in 2014 or? 15, 2015. 2015, right. okay. Um, has your personal opinion wavered on anything in the book? that you were maybe more dogmatic about and then since a new film has come out or something's changed, you've actually changed your opinion on it? No, I mean, uh, only in the sense that when you're writing a book, you know, if it was a blog or something else, you can be a, li a little bit more like, this is what's working today and right now. Um, I wrote that book and the new book I'm working on also about distribution, uh, I focus on principles, not rules, not gimmicks, not trends, principles. Principles are, I mean, think about like engineering, for instance. We sent human beings to the moon and returned them to the earth with uh, as much computing power on board as a four-function calculator. People were using slide rulers at NASA to calculate how are we going to land an object on the moon. So you would think technology today is going to, you know, send us to wherever and all these other things. The truth is the principles that work in technology today in an engineering level are exactly the same as they were in the 60s. Just different tools to get to the same result. Writing for the green light's the same idea. If you're trying to be a writer, if you're trying to build your career as a writer, 
there are certain tools that you can have in your toolkit that are going to propel you, and there are others that are just going to hold you back. Those goldmine genres that I wrote about in that book are as true today as they were in the 60s, as they were in the 40s, as they will be 30 years from now. You know, Sharknado is a great example of a creature feature. Uh, you see women in peril thrillers all the time on TV. You see them all over the world. Uh, action movies uh, with, with aging stars have been here from the beginning of the B movie as the second tier to a major one, and they're going to continue no matter what. They were big in the 80s and the 90s because of video rentals, uh, and now they're big today because of VOD opportunities. It's the con these are just core value content pieces that every company looks for in one capacity or another. Um, so, in truth, it's as true when it was written a few years ago as it will be in the future, too. And because it's a book, uh, I really focused on the stuff that's going to stick around. From your book, uh, Writing for the Green Light, have there been success stories where people have reached out to you? Uh, yeah, um, and it was very meaningful to see it, actually, because, uh, um, you know, it's I, I got a, okay, writing for the green light is not, I wrote this great script in three days and I'm emotionally invested in it and I want to see it on the big screen. Writing for the green light is about writers who want to write professionally, who want to figure out that great question that no other book really answers and it's really just how do you begin that process? How do you talk to people? How do you pitch your work? Um, and so that's why we kind of focus on the goldmine genres that are like the tried and tested, they're going to be around forever type things. Um, so the process of writing a script or getting a job as a writer is not, I wrote the script and I'm going to sell it. Writing begins with being able to showcase you can write. Writing it requires that when a production company is in a crunch and they need a writer who can just get the job done the first time around, you're the person to hire. So writing for the green light is, is about helping writers become that if that's what they want to become. So the success stories I saw were people changed their style of writing. They gave it a, you know, a shot and um, uh, you know, one woman wrote out to me that uh, uh, she read the book, she wrote a woman in peril thriller, um, she sent it off and was basically given a writer for hire agreement, a step agreement, which was basically we really liked your work um, you obviously know the kind of genre that we like to work with. We need this script written. Can you write it? Give us a treatment. Uh, you know, I had another woman reach out to me basically saying, I, I read this book, I thought it was interesting, so I gave it a shot. She wrote a Christmas dog family movie. Um, and basically she did it as kind of a, I wouldn't say a joke, but like, I'm just going to spit this out and see what happens, you know. So she wrote it in two weeks and all of a sudden this script got a lot of attention. She got an agent, uh, it won festivals, and it got optioned. Uh, I don't think it's been produced, but I mean like that's the kind of thing where it's just... Writing for the Greenlight is about those writers who find... like there's so many, Okay, everyone in Hollywood it feels like is a screenwriter. Everyone has a script or they dabble with it, etc. And the truth is most of them are really, really, really good writers. They just write the wrong stuff. And because they write the wrong stuff, they blend in with all of those piles of scripts in production houses that no one takes seriously. So it's about writing stuff that's going to elevate you, uh, make you stand out, and have your work be taken seriously, to have it get noticed. That's sort of the idea of it. So I've had a couple of other people who've had successes. One guy uh, got a, uh, was asked to write a treatment, a flesh out a full treatment of a story, and he got a first draft out of it. Um, it's beginning that process. So it's only been two years or so, and you know, it's, it's getting real results, which I love. It's, it's meaningful to see that there are people out there who are uh, uh, fulfilling their goals and, and in a way they've just never had it spelled out, this is how you do it. This is the AB, this is the instruction manual for your game plan, you know? Yeah, had a lot of positive comments on Amazon and um, the video interview that we did uh, with you uh, back, uh, was it, I think it was more 2014 for us, but 
Wasn't 2014? It was March 2015. 2015. Okay. Sorry. I, don't know what I only remember that okay. because uh, oh. of, it was around. I, I knew so, where I was uh -huh, yeah. when I was leaving Mar Vista, <laughs> oh, shifting to DRG. So. Okay. All right. Well, one comment that came in on the video interview that we did, which I felt was constructive um, question, um, was um, one lady put um, regarding gold mine genre that I don't understand something. If one should focus on goldmine genres, then how do deeper, more meaningful indie movies get picked up at film festivals? The Wrestler was Robert Siegel's first screenplay, but The Wrestler isn't a goldmine genre movie. It's a, quote, boring drama, as you would playfully describe it. Um, thank you to anyone with an opinion on this matter. So. I, f I felt it was a, you know, just constructive question. It's a totally yeah. valid mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there are great dramatic films. I, I, I say don't write dramas. I say don't write comedies. I say don't write a lot of these things. Not because they aren't successful films. It's, it's most independent production companies or distribution companies. Uh, those require a lot more work. They, they're a lot more difficult and complex to package together. Okay, it's, it, I don't know the story of, of The Wrestler as far as in how it came from you know, embryonic idea to how it got to Darren Aronofsky, but he's not a nobody in town. Sure. And if he was connected to the writer in some way or, or how it got from point A to point B, I'm not visible to that. I know the other story that always gets brought up is uh, uh, Diablo Cody. Um, so when she wrote Juno, same situation. It's a it's a indie boring drama, as Scott describes. How, how is that possible? <laughs> well, she wasn't a first time writer. She's a first time screenwriter, but she had a very successful blog. She had, uh, uh, I believe, a book that she had written with a manager about her experiences, because her blog was all about being a stripper and, and some of the the trials and tribulations of that. So she got a lot of attention for having a, a fan base as a blogger then wrote a book, and then, you know, basically had this great idea for a movie. But she also had a network of a manager and agents and, and a fan base of people that she kind of had formulated who she was as a writer. And then had, you know, people connected in Hollywood to be able to get that passed from point A to point B. So she's connected. She's not your newbie writer who has zero connections in Hollywood. For the people who have zero connections in Hollywood, that route isn't the easiest to get into. So writing for the green light is about getting to that point. How do you get to the point of having a, 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 you know, a collection of professionals to speak to, to pitch your ideas to? That's what it's really about. Um, and there's all kinds of great genres in the indie space, but a lot of them are also developed internally where uh, you know, pre-sales are put together or production company A has a relationship with some major talent and that major talent brings in a story that's very interesting. Distribution company brought on board knows how to pre-sale it to six companies in different territories on the planet and then they hire a writer or they go out to agencies and they find a writer who is up and coming that they can assign it to. Like that's kind of how that stuff works. So to get there, you kind of ha first have to pass the litmus test of, of being seen as a writer that can deliver and, and getting yourself kind of, getting your feet wet in the business. Y you know, that's a major leap and you can get there and I'm just saying don't go out of the gate writing that stuff. Don't have those great films and those great scripts of yours be the ones you showcase to Hollywood because people are just going to go, this is great, but we got 30 others just like them and they're connected to other projects, or they're attached to something, this one isn't. So I'll put it to the side and we'll see what happens and usually nothing does. And it doesn't mean that it's not a great script, it just means it's not attached to things. So to overcome that hurdle, uh, the goldmine genres are, this is a great stepping stone to getting to that level where when a production company or an agent or whomever is looking for that person who can make something happen, magical on the page, you're the person they call instead of the thousands of other scripts they have sitting on file someplace. That's the idea of it. Right, and, and I know that Diablo Cody was referenced in, in one of your videos too. And what about like similar, like a Tucker Max, somebody like that where he had a blog, same type of thing. I don't know if he was new to the industry, but it sounds like it's similar to that. There was already a following there, and so it wasn't just mm -hmm. like a newbie yeah. out of the gate. Look, the, the idea is um, like, there has to be an end user 
if you want people to transact on what you're creating, whether you're writing a script, whether you're selling a product that you invented, whatever it is, like if you want to transact on whatever it is that you're inventing, you have to have people to put it in front of. Uh, in the blogging sphere today, uh, especially with YouTube influencers and all this, I mean, the reason YouTube influencers are so popular, uh, is at least on my side of the business where they get cast in movies and stuff, is because they have an actual numerical figure attached to their names of the people that they reach. So if you have a film like, you know, Camp Dakota is probably the most known example. You have YouTube influencers who, uh, in some ways, redesigned how we communicate and pitch movies to people and get people involved early and all that. But the truth is, they're not doing anything that hasn't been done since the beginning of time in terms of having finding an audience, understanding what that audience wants, uh, and then speaking to them and catering to them. And honestly, you're doing the exact same thing with Film Courage. You have a core group of people who uh, you know, view the videos, they have a vested interest in learning more about this business and how they can improve their career within it. And you know, when, as we just did with Diablo Cody, when, when, you ask, when they ask questions about how does this work, how does that work, those are the questions you ask people like me and like other you know, people you've interviewed to get the answers. I've seen you say something about the big secret that never gets told to anyone outside of Hollywood is that most films are greenlit before the final script is made. Yeah. So do tell, because to a lot of people that aren't from here or aren't familiar with the business, I think they'd, they'd be sort of shocked to know that. Um, it's important to remember that movies and TV shows cost an incredible amount of money to produce. And if there's nobody to watch it on the backside or to transact upon it on iTunes or at a movie theater, uh, then there's not much of a point in doing that. And there's, there's an even more expensive aspect of producing something, which is marketing it and getting it out in front of people so they know it exists, so that when they're interested in seeing it and ready to buy tickets or download it uh, behind a paywall and pay money for it, uh, they have the ability to do it and they're ready to do it right away. Um, so that's the financial end. So people in my position, all, I mean, from where I'm working all the way up to top executives at studios, um, what those people, the end users, want to see is really, really important. And that's kind of where we're thinking because if the end users are interested in seeing it, then international countries would be interested in also having access to it. Uh, and they would be willing to invest money to have access to it early, which is where the whole pre-sale game kind of comes into play. Um, or, you know, a TV channel here in the US, if they know their audience wants something very specific, they will kind of work to have that produced on their network and they'll kind of work backwards uh, uh, you know, first finding out what kind of project it's got to be, the types of people who have to be in it, uh, and then working their way backwards to uh, get to the point of actually drafting, writing, and creating, and all that. So on, on the big scale, for these major, major productions at the studio level or the major network level, that's why they go for things like major franchises or very well-known books or very well-known media properties or doing remakes. There's already an audience there they already kind of have an estimate of how it's going to be, you know, get from point A to point B. And that's where the business side of it really plays. It's what is it? How is it going to work? Where's the money coming from? And who's going to get paid what to make this whole process happen? That's got to all be figured out before you really hone in on the right script. Most screenwriting books approach it as you write a story and it evolves into a movie. And this whole industry doesn't exist with people twiddling their thumbs, waiting for the right script to drop into their hands. It works the opposite direction, which is we know we need this type of content to be successful. We have certain channels or certain you know, platforms that we have to cater to with content. So that's the stuff we're going to be looking for as finished content, or we'll go make it ourselves. Um, you know, that's what Mar Vista did really well. In, in writing for the green light, uh, uh, I, the whole first chapter is exactly about that idea. Um, we, I used to go to Cannes, I used to go to Berlin, to the major film festivals, I'd meet with my buyers. We would have a slate of movies that we were going to pitch, and we would see which ones had traction, which ones didn't. 
we had a reputation for being able to produce or deliver movies that would get from point A to point B and be delivered on time and be quality productions. We'd get the pre-sales first, and then we'd go back and say, okay, write a movie based on the pre-sales. Write a movie based on the poster we invented to sell the pre-sales. That's how it really works. Content is developed from the inside out. The occasional one-off to that or the occasional exclusion is when major A-list talent um, who already have a very well-established career come up with unique ideas, but frankly, they can walk into CAA or a top executive's you know, office wherever in town and just say, here's an idea I'm thinking of, and it can be greenlit right on the spot in the sense that they can move forward with it. Should a screenwriter start designing the movie poster before the script is written? No. I don't think so. I mean, I mentioned that in the Writing for the Greenlight book because that's how we did it. We already had the established connection and track record of being able to pre-sale movies and to produce them and deliver them and have them actually meet the expectations of what we promised to deliver. And we had a whole marketing department that knew how to create poster work specifically for the movie buying audience. You can usually tell um, when an indie producer has drafted their own artwork uh, versus when it's done by you know a company that's used to selling into the movie space because it just has a completely different look. It's, it's not a, a marketable, punchy, pushy type poster. Not that there's anything wrong with it, it's just that it's not the type of stuff that attracts buyers from all over the world or you know things of that nature they get redesigned and redesigned throughout the whole process um, i think the screenwriter shouldn't worry about that stuff they're not going to be in a position especially starting out where they have to pre-sell their project to buyers they're selling themselves they're not even selling their script really they're selling their talent to write so they shouldn't have to focus on the marketing components of creating artwork they should focus on making sure that they're, you know, producing a library of work, a portfolio that they can showcase that's ideally all of the same type of genre, so they can just be the go-to screenwriter who can deliver that type of, of film quickly and reliably. Just as, as I'm saying, we, we would sell movies, pre-sell movies off of the poster. People would pay us and, and pre-buy them because they knew we could deliver them. There's a lot of companies that try to pre-sell that fail. I've worked with ones that were very successful because we had the track record of being able to reliably deliver on time a good quality product. So that's what the screenwriter wants to do just from a writing perspective. Here's my showcase of what I can do. This proves a track record. Uh, if you give me the opportunity, you can guarantee and trust that I'm gonna get it done uh, correctly the first time. So why do you think those other titles failed? What was the reason? Did it have nothing to, I mean, you said that there were others that tried the same approach, but they oh, failed. Other companies, mm -hmm. especially yeah. that, uh, that, look, pre-sales is this really sexy, fun idea of like, you know, I'm, my idea is going to be so great, I'm just going to get 20 countries to jump on board and buy it. You really have to know how the pre-sale process works, who the buyers are at these companies that are willing to invest that money. You have to, uh, you know, already have produced a decent amount of content that's going to... Uh, kind of prove the fact that you know what you're doing and you can deliver movies on time that are under budget or on budget uh, that meet all the technical specifications of that specific country. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a delicate process and it's not easy to do and not all companies do it. And there's a lot of companies that have no interest in even trying it. Um, but the idea of selling a movie off of a poster uh, that really only today happens at the pre-sale stage and not every company does pre-sales. Big studios, they'll come out and basically say, this is our slate independent companies, we have to go build those relationships because we don't have output deals with everybody. We don't have guaranteed buys in you know, the majority of the countries of the world the way studios do. So those companies that try to do that have to be very, um, they have to have a very good reputation for being able to already accomplish what they're selling themselves to be able to do. And you're working on a new book. Yes. And it's about? Distribution. So it's taking the same concepts of writing for the green light, how it broke down the process of, look, this is all the stuff that really happens that's never really talked about in books uh, or anywhere else for that matter, about how this process really works from beginning to end and how the whole thing is really reverse engineered. 
So it does the same thing for the distribution process. Um, it looks into things like how do you sell a movie that doesn't exist? Uh, the, as I just said, pre-sales. How, uh, how do companies buy and sell content that's already completed? Um, how, do, how do deals get negotiated from beginning to end? Uh, what are all the little loopholes and accounting that you have to be careful of and you know all that stuff and more importantly I think is where do filmmakers and novices and newbies and hopeful producers fit into the whole scheme of, of this what is the landscape uh, I think that's very important but uh, the thing I really focus on the most are what I call the foundations and the principles of distribution just as I did for writing for the green light with the gold mine genres these are the pillars that basically all companies kind of operate around um, we do the same thing here. You know, ideas about how movies are really valued, how, how rights really work, and how deals really take place. What about the likelihood that someone will be paid up front versus on the back end? For a script? Uh, for the, the distribution rights of their finished film. It, I, I couldn't even quantify like a, a probability. It's, uh, uh, I like to think in the sense that um, Buyers try to gain as much for as little as possible, and people with something to sell try to sell it for, like, give away as little as possible for the most money. And it's finding that balance between the two where the deals take place. So uh, the likelihood, uh, I would kind of put it more in the sense of what is it about the project, the movie, the whatever, that makes it worth money? Uh, remember, it's very expensive for companies to acquire content, to buy movies, to even just to pick them up for free. There's an incredible amount of work they have to do on the backside to get it market ready and to get it from point A to point B. So if they acquire a movie for free, they are incurring a great deal of costs. Um, so they have to weigh that in a great deal when they're evaluating stuff. And sometimes they're willing to take a risk on a movie that they personally like and they're not sure how well it might even perform in the market. That would be more of an option where they're not willing to risk as much of their buying budget to acquire it. But if there are things in a film, if it's a goldmine genre, if it has certain level of cast attached to it, um, if it's truly market ready and completed and everything else, um, it might be worth a decent amount of money. And if there's some real talent associated with it, as I said, like that is what elevates movies in the indie space. First question I always get asked by international buyers, who's in it? That's what separates a movie with nobody in it that you know probably didn't have much of a budget versus a movie that understands and knows how to create content for the marketplace. And speaking of which, if a filmmaker goes to AFM, what should they be prepared to answer? You know, when we see these people pitch their startups or whatever, they, it's like they have these answers ready to go. What same thing for someone going to pitch their film at AFM? Um, again, we kind of go back to the idea of. People go to AFM ready to pitch themselves and their content and what they have and what they're bringing and how great it is. And they'll just go door to door to door, you know, this is what I am, this is what I have, me, 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 me. And uh, uh, there's very little attention paid to the opposite side. We've all seen these guys at bars who just hit on one girl and then it fails, next girl, next girl. And you just, it's like just walking down an aisle, you know, one after the other and you just hear all the doors slamming shut. And it's that kind of concept of a producer, a filmmaker, a writer has to look at each company and really understand what it is that they do. They are in the business of selling and distributing content that is very much in alignment with the content that the producer, the director, the writer is trying to sell. Um, they have to go into the conversation, not me, 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 this is what I have to sell you. How much money do you have? It's much more we seem to have a lot in common here. Um, would there be opportunities for me to maybe showcase my work in case you ever need a writer uh, uh, that you can call upon if you're in a crunch? The first chapter of writing for The Green Light is about that. It's about we pre-sold a movie based on a poster. It got greenlit at in, in, in a, in a board meeting, and then it was assigned to a producer who's pretty new to the company. And so he didn't go to an agency and start, you know, combing through scripts. He didn't go to our back room and start reading scripts from page one. He called a friend of his, he knew he could write, and he got the job You know, the next day. He needed a script in three weeks because that's when they started production. And he had 9,000 other things to focus on. 
producing that project. So he just wanted to know the script component was completed. So when you're going to AFM, it's kind of the same idea where these are all companies who are there for one thing, and that's they're trying to sell their content to distributors. They're trying to get their, I mean, to international distributors, to, to broker deals. They're trying to make money for the content that they're bringing to the market. That's why they have expensive booths set up. So you have to walk in that door with something to offer them, a way to help make their job easier. And I find that with that approach, you stand out from the masses of people going, me, 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 my script, my script. And you go, this company just isn't in alignment with what I'm selling, so I'm not going to waste their time. This company very much is. And you have to be respectful of the fact that at a market like that, that's not necessarily the best place to have that conversation on the fly. It's much more of a make the initial connection, get the contact details, find out if there's an appropriate time in the near future to have that conversation. You wrote a blog post, I think a few years back, maybe, that mentioned Tim Burton's 1994 biopic on Ed Wood. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent film, by the way. Yeah, Johnny one Depp. of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, so you say that that film is really important because it shows uh, still current examples of how uh, films get made today. Any thoughts? I mean, yeah. on a lower level. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, in truth, like, those budgets back then were massive today, you know, like the kind of films that were getting made or the Roger Corman era of, of making films. You know, it's um, uh, one of the things, okay, one of the opening scenes of that movie, uh, Ed Wood, um, Christine Jorgensen's story, that's what it was. It was basically a, a transgendered individual back in the 50s and some schlock producer was uh, making a film about it. And so Ed Wood seized the opportunity, walked into the door, set up a, a, a meeting with Mr. Weiss, and uh, pitched himself as the guy who had to make the movie. And uh, because he was so enthusiastic, because in truth he was a transvestite, but was very secretive about it, um, and he just understood the, the compelling elements of the story that had to be created, blah, 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 blah. And then the producer's response was more or less, I don't care. I need a producer, I need, I need a guy who can make a film in three days and make me a profit. That's all I care about. And the reason was, is he already pre-sold theaters in all of these states and, and you know, needed a movie to cater to that. He, he needed a movie that was so many reels long, using old film terminology, uh, that was a certain budget level that could be shot in a certain amount of time, and he didn't care the quality, he just needed the product to fill in the gaps of where it was pre-sold. It still happens today. It's no different. It's the same concept in the indie space today of movies get kind of pre-sold, pre-created, pre-developed, and then they need writers, producers, very creative-minded people to put that together in a short period of time and make it happen. That's the real job of a creator, is creating, making things happen, getting from point A to point B quickly and effectively. Um, that's why at the studio level, uh, major talents get tons of money and they receive ridiculous sums of money for screenplays at the, at the studio level because frankly it takes a lot of work and it's a very very rare talent to to be able to produce that level so uh that's that's kind of why it works that way but if you haven't seen it i mean if for anyone in the audience who hasn't seen it it's a great movie very fun and the whole process throughout you actually learn a lot of great lessons about the filmmaking process and even though it's from the 90s and talking about an era in the 50s, the principles are exactly the same. It still works the same way, and always will, I think. What about the Bella Lugosi character? Is there any... any... Same concept. It's, it's an aging star uh, who, frankly, was kind of washed up at the time. Um, but it's the same idea of... Uh, I think even in that opening scene that I'm talking about, that was one of the things, is that he, he later went back into the office to secure the job, because he'd written a script in two days, uh, and he had Bella Lugosi, who was a star. So he basically said, if you, if, if you need a schmuck who can get you a movie in three days <laughs> with a star, make, make, make me crap. I forget how he described it. It was very good, though. And he's basically just like, you know, crap with a star. That's what it was called. And uh, uh, that's basically Bella Lugosi was the star who was at least a decent enough name that people recognized that elevated the product just enough. So it became a Bella Lugosi movie uh, you know, that was being distributed at that point. And last but not least, his efforts to secure finance. So, so meeting the right person and having to go to certain lengths to, to secure financing. Yeah, so I think there's a massive misconception. Like, when it comes to financing, 
uh, as I kind of said, movies are incredibly expensive to produce. And people on the writing end, the directing end, the producing end who want to get their work made seem to be very, very good at writing and, and keeping budget in mind and they're really good at creating budgets and all the great software that exists now but that getting to that point of well, how is it going to be funded that's sort of the complicated thing in ed wood and i think the hopeful thing that a lot of younger filmmakers hope is that they can just go to a rich uncle or dentists or all this other stuff and just pool money together um, but wherever money comes from and it you can still get movies off the ground using that approach um, at a higher level, you know, if you're creating content that's going to work for platforms out there, there are a lot of entities that will, will actually invest the money and get that. So it's it's kind of, I don't know, I feel like I'm getting a little lost in it, but it's like, it's not as cut and dry. Sure. It's always a mystery as to where and how funding comes together uh, at the indie level because there's no one way to do it. But the truth is, uh, uh, if you're creating content that actually has placement, that actually already has a spot to fill, that actually already has room on a shelf to be placed, um, there are a lot of entities who uh, are willing to invest the money into it. I think, I think the real answer is, if you're going out there to produce something that you want to produce because you're passionate about it, and you've not done any real market research or talked to companies about what the market wants, you're gonna have a really tough time getting financing. If you take a step back, you focus on what the market needs, what it's asking for, what companies are searching for, and then you cater to those needs, financing actually becomes a lot easier because all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot of companies with deep pockets and they are looking to invest the money. They're just looking to invest it with stuff that's gonna help their goals. In Writing for the Green Light, you have chapter four, and that's entitled, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Write for Television. Yes. I love that title. So can you talk about some of the highlights of that chapter? Yeah. Um, I, when I was sort of newer to the industry, uh, there was always sort of two schools of thought. You either wrote for television or you wrote for movies. Um, the movie side is kind of cut and dry. There's the three-act structure, et cetera, whereas television's kind of all over the map. Um, and what I was always taught when I was younger was you have to write a spec script of a major TV series that you can kind of showcase your talent and, and showcase you know how to you know grasp how television works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in this chapter, I kind of expose television as being very different than movies. In, in the movie side, I'm very adamant, never write drama, never write comedy when you're starting out. If you have great ideas for drama and comedy and you want to write features, excellent, just back pocket them for a while and get the contacts first. Television's the complete opposite. In television, uh, you should really focus on writing only drama or only comedy and doing both extremely, extremely well. And if you're going to be doing drama, you want to focus on hour-long dramas. If you want to do comedy, you want to focus on half-hour comedies. Um, and that's just something that's a polar opposite of how you're going to break into the film side of things. Television is kind of breaking some of the things I talk about in the movie side. The other thing with TV is it's open-ended. Um, movies have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's a conclusion and there's something we pull from it after we experience it. TV needs to be not a story arc, it needs to be a platform. A strong platform built with interesting characters uh, who are consistently able to be reintroduced to each other with new beginning, middle, end episodes and then re-put together and re-put together time and time and time again. One of the best shows on TV is Law & Order. It does this in a fantastic way. Uh, I believe it's almost at a thousand episodes across all the different uh, you know, types of the show, the styles of the show. Um, but what it is, is it doesn't matter where you begin that show. You can start that show any season, any episode, and you are not missing a thing. There are great character developments that take place with the characters if you watch all the episodes, but you're not, you do not have to watch it in um, a chronological order. If you've missed the first five episodes, you, you don't have to go catch up. You know, if, some, if, if, if you start in the middle of an episode, you can actually catch up with where things are going because each thing is a self-contained, you know, short form movie. 
that can just replicate and replicate and replicate. That's what Star Trek is. It's a great platform for a consistent, endless output of content. And television isn't just that. We're thinking scripted here. Most television content is non-scripted, factual content, or you know, late night talk shows, uh, uh, you know, lifestyle programs that have narration. Remember, you know, these programs need writers too. They have to be organized and orchestrated, and documentaries have to be, you know, pieced together. Uh, magazine shows like news programs have to be written. Um, so for writers who want to get a beginning start in the business, television sometimes offers really interesting out-of-the-box ways to get your feet wet. You can go to any of the shows that film here, the late night talk shows, uh, and, and become a joke writer. They'll pay you, you know, you submit your jokes every single day, uh, and then, you know, they'll pay you for the ones they use. You know, the comedians on the shows don't write the monologue every night. It's a team of writers. That's a great way to be on set and to become a staff writer. Um, you know, getting your work out there and exposed and, 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 you know, working in talk shows or any other kind of factual place gets you into the business of working with these people, and it's a great stepping stone to begin working uh, in the scripted world as too. Uh, in fact, that's how, how I met your mother. The team behind that, that's where they came from, was writing gags and jokes for late night talk shows and they, they got access to the studio and built their way up from there on the personal side. Meanwhile, of course, they're writing like hell at night and, and working and building up their portfolio of work. So, Writing well, though, you said, I mean, I know that's very subjective, and, and, but, but some things are going to take and some things aren't. What you're asking is what constitutes good writing and if you write well, if, if you are writing scripts or stories or treatments that are just great ideas, that's all you have to do as a writer. And that's not the case. You have to get those, not just to, it's not just getting those to the right people. It's not aimlessly sending them out. Eventually, if I keep throwing spaghetti at the wall, it'll stick. It's structured and strategized. Um, to be a writer, you have to think about what gets produced. As I said, movies cost a lot of money. TV shows cost even more money, in a sense, to produce. And it costs a lot of money to market to people so that there's an audience ready to watch it on the other side. So um, if you are writing stuff that's kind of catered to that, or that's ne when, when TV shows and movies need a writer, if you're writing to be seen as that writer who can deliver it, you're not throwing spaghetti against the wall. You're going in with a strategy, with a game plan, with a with an objective and a plan. It's uh, it's if you just write aimlessly, you're not. There's always exceptions, of course, and outliers. But your chances of being able to just like write something great and have it get picked up and turned into a studio movie, like it's just not going to happen. Um, but you can strategically set up your career in a way where you are writing stuff that the industry needs. Uh, and you will see people coming to you and, and working with you or taking your calls or, or asking to read your stuff. Just as products today are, you know, big data tells people who their users are down to how they're watching it, who this person is, their age demographics, income, all that. Uh, how much should someone know their audience for their film? Like how much should they really study and shrink it down? Oh, it's going to be a person in this age range, this income bracket, watching it on their home television set. It's going to be at the holidays. The, the, the truth to that, and it's great that you're bringing that up, is that's not a, like a newbie writer or a newbie producer uh, and a hopeful director. That's in truth, that's the component they don't have to worry about as much. That is where it falls more into my role or our role in the distribution world. Um, we know those answers. We know the audience that we're selling to. We're not, we're not directly selling to an audience audience, people actually buying the movie at a, you know, on iTunes. We're selling to the company in between that's placing that movie there, that's making it available to audiences. They tell us what we need, and then we kind of create content that's going to deliver to that and through that source. Um, a television channel is that. It's a platform that reaches audience. They know what their audience likes. They know all the metrics and details of that audience. They tell us what they need. So we know what's needed. What we need from a writer is to know, can they write? Are they reliable? Can they hit the genre conventions well? 
Um, the reason I talk about the gold mine genres and writing for the green light and then also the television chapter is it's a great way of saying, look, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to overthink it. Hit these buckets. Focus on these types of genres. And even if you make mistakes, even if there's uh, uh, novice errors like, you know, slight inconsistencies or maybe a typo, it's going to be okay because there's so few people who write that kind of stuff, the stuff that Hollywood truly needs. So, you know, metricing out whether the lead female is 42 or 47 is meaningless in a way. It's, it's all right, middle-aged woman. That's all we need to know. Woman in Peril Thriller, got it. Are you hitting the genre conventions? Great. We're not going to buy that script. We're going to hire your services as a writer to write the script we do need, where we've already figured out all that stuff, and we'll let you know about it. That's how it really works. So for an individual writer, for an individual filmmaker, don't sweat that stuff. That is the component of the business that you truly can say, I'll let other people worry about that because they're going to be informing me what I need. But first, you've got to get over that hurdle of how are you going to have that relationship? And to get there, focus on the goldmine genres, build that relationship, get noticed, then the steps will follow. That's a great point. You said that, that they actually do need to worry about because I think there's a misconception that a lot of people, oh, when I get to this level, I won't have to worry about that. But then it's, it's the chicken before the egg type of thing. Well, at what point are you going to be at that level? So what are some things that people really do need to pay attention to to launch their career or to get their work seen that they think they don't? Uh, to be mindful of where their role fits into the total landscape of the business. Um, you know, uh, in distribution, in, in the media business in general, um, it, it's really, we're following the lead of an audience. Audiences tell us what they want. And we just have the skill sets, the connections, and the ability to hear that, find the content that's going to work, or find a way to create it, and then find the people who can help us create it, and then package it and get it out to people. You know, that's what distribution is. And uh, for people who are trying to kind of cross that first hurdle in their career, the thing, they, they need to be very cognizant of that, and they need to be very understanding that, yes, filmmaking is an art, but it is a business before it's an art. It, Thomas Edison did not invent the film camera uh, just because it was going to open the pathways to creating great stories. He did it as a way to sell a product and to sell visual images that people would buy. Edward Moybridge, who created series photography, there's a reason all the, the, the characters in his work are nude, because they needed to sell the imagery. They needed to sell the package. Uh, and in fact, the, the famous horse that was running and all four legs were up at the same time, it was a bet uh, as to whether that actually existed. So I mean, the first movie, which was Edward Moybridge's Running Horse, I don't know what it's called, uh, uh, it was a transacted Produce this for us so we can win a bet. That's how media works. It's here's the audience, here's the money, produce something so it fits this and we can continue that process going that assembly line. It's very easy to criticize the assembly line when you're on the creative side, when you're new to it. You know, I don't want to sell out. I don't want to just make frivolous junk. I get it. Um, but there is a great common ground in the middle there where there's an audience who wants certain kinds of content and there are distribution companies willing to pay for it and help put the financing together, and we need creative people to jump in and make it happen. And there are amazing movies that are very, very genre-oriented uh, that, that are, are great stories, meaningful, and have surpassed time in terms of, you know, people still reference them and go back to them and re-watch them, and they're very, very, very commercial products. Uh, so, you know, it's a business first. It, it, films would not get funded if there wasn't money to pay for it. And people wouldn't be investing in movies if there wasn't a profit to be made on the back end. Very few, very few. I thought that was great that you said that criticize the assembly line because we do get a lot of comments on our videos about that and not just the, the one that you did about your book, but you know, 
people that criticize the, the comic book uh, franchise and things like that. But the thing is, is that it's there for a reason. And I'm not saying that I'm a total fan of that genre by any means, and I get what they're saying. But I, I think it's a lot of times hard for a lot of artists to accept that because they are artists. They don't want to write just something that's going to sell, and it's it's finding that balance. You know, we still need to get a job even though we may not like doing certain things. We still need to bring in some kind of income. So it's an interesting debate. The, I mean, look, the greatest works of art in history, go to Europe and go to some museums, the Renaissance, it's commissioned work. Michelangelo was a commissioned artist. You know, the Sistine Chapel was not a vision he had. He was hired to produce it. He took his talent and his initiative to bring life to it and to make it a masterpiece. But he was hired to, hey, we got the ceiling and we don't know what to do with it. So, you know, you came recommended to us. You know, so it's, it, that's how so, it works. And that's, that's been art from the beginning. <clears throat> Great expectations. This giant book we all had to read in high school. The reason it's so giant is because Charles Dickens had uh, a whole family with dozens of kids that he needed to feed, and he was being hired every two weeks to keep an, a, an attentive audience entertained. So he said, all right, I'm gonna keep this story going because I'm making money doing it. And he was being paid by the magazine because the magazine had an audience willing to pay for it to keep it going. Uh, the money comes first. If there's not money there, if there's not something to be transacted upon and a profit to be made, there is no art. There's nothing to be created because no one's going to pay for it uh, except a couple of wacky people who are willing to sink money into some projects. But if you want a career and if you want to get to a point where you can express your artistry, you first have to know and, and prove, more importantly prove, that you can actually get the job done in the first place. So is there a way to soften the sellout label? It's, it's been bandied around so much and I get why people go there, but I feel like sometimes it's, it's overused. My opinion is that Selling isn't selling out. No? Uh, selling out is sort of when you, um, like you just throw in a towel in a sense. Like you, you, how do I say this? Working in a way where you are creating stuff that matches what audiences want is not selling out. You can, look, there's still so much, you know, latitude you can have with a script, with a story, even if you're working in the convention of woman in peril thriller or uh, a aging male action hero film, you know, like there's, that's just, that's an architecture, you know, like the great, I've, I've used this reference before in, in some other interviews I've done, like, like great architects have rules they have to follow. There's gravity, we have to deal with that fact. We have to deal with building codes. We have to deal with the costs of creating the structure. You know, It's not an open-ended budget. The bridge has to serve a function. It can't just be something artistically and architecturally profound. There has to be a purpose for it and there has to be a reason why it's existing. Um, what makes it art is what you do with that, how much of yourself you put into that. So getting to a point where you were presenting yourself to the market and saying, I can do this stuff and I can add a spin to it, that's not selling out, that's selling yourself. That's building your career and that's getting you to a point where you're actually going to have clout, you're gonna have connections, you're going to have a track record, you're gonna have a whole history of, of films or projects that you've been associated with that have been successful, commercially viable, and then you can cash in on some of those great connections you have and say, I want to do something a little bit different. That's why I always go back to the, the gold mine genres. I say don't write drama, don't write comedy. What I mean is don't write them out of the gate. If you have a great idea, keep it on the back burner for a bit because once you build your career and you have connections, you can then take it off and say, look, I know I'm known for this kind of thing, but we have a great relationship and what do you think of this? You now have opened that door to create something fantastic. And look at most of the film directors that are so well renowned today. Look at where they began. I mean, look at how many careers Roger Corman started. You know, it's uh, most great talents, you know, don't rush out of the gate with masterpieces. And Robert Town, who wrote 
Chinatown also wrote Days of Thunder. Like, this is just the way it is. It's a business and we all have to pay bills and uh, selling, selling yourself and being paid for your work and having successful work is nothing to be ashamed of. And frankly, people that feel that way or want to throw that label around probably aren't going to get too far. They're, they're shooting themselves in the foot. Right. Why do you think people go there with that label? I mean, it's easy. I think it's, it's e I think it's really, really easy. I think it's really easy to cut others down. I think it's really easy to call anybody who's doing something that is slightly commercial a sellout. You know, label them because, God forbid, they might actually become a little bit successful doing it. Um, it I think it's also an easy way to cover up for one's own insecurity about their own work. Uh, I think that happens a lot too. He's a sellout, she's a sellout, you know, whatever. It's like, well, how is your work gonna get from point A to point B? <laughs> Frankly, I don't know too many people in boardroom meetings, uh, talents, when they come in to pitch their work, who have a really pissy attitude. I don't really see them get too far. It's usually much more of a collaborative conversation. It's usually much more of a how can we work together? How can we do this? What do you need in the story? Being being receptive of notes and feedback. You know, those are people that do well in life uh, and do very well in this career. The people that sit there going, "No, it's my way or the highway," and you don't have a track record of anything behind you. Like, who's going to invest in your project? Frankly, that's just my opinion. Oh, that's a great point. There's probably uh, there's always an outlier, one amazing script. It's once in a blue moon. But to be honest, I've never heard of it or seen it. I'll keep my eyes open though. Okay. What thoughts do you have on DIY release strategies? Look, I guess the criticism I get a lot of the things I hear from people all the time are I don't understand that businessy stuff and I don't I don't get the distribution stuff and you know it's always I'm going to focus on making my movie and somebody else will deal with all that. Truth is today uh, it's never been easier to produce a movie or any type of media content in general. The technology is fantastic, the costs have dropped tremendously, and anybody can do it. The problem is because anybody can do it, there's tons of it. And so it's more important, I think, now for filmmakers and writers to be cognizant of uh, what is needed in the marketplace and how that whole end process works. And the great thing is that there's never been a better time in this industry for people to do it all on their own. Anybody can create a website, anybody can create a blog, anybody can build a fan base using social media platforms, anybody can you know, spit out and leak information about their title and build up an audience and build up an interest and have that magical moment when the product is ready to be released, already have a great collection of people out there willing to buy it. So it's, uh, I guess my view on it is it's just, it, there's never been as much power in the hands of individuals and individual content creators as there has now, and I think that's only going to increase. So I think the ability to take a project, an idea from beginning to end, cheaply, effectively, uh, with very strong results, has never been more in the power of individual filmmakers. So for those people who want to do their you know, project that is outside of the conventions of what I talk about in writing for the green light, they certainly can, and they, they you know, should pursue what they want. But if you still produce within the genre conventions I write about, you're gonna see a lot more traction, I think, on the professional side, because that's gonna stand out a bit that they were able to put a project like that together, make a bit of profit on it uh, uh, for a very cheap budget. That's somebody who can prove to themselves, we can bring them in and, and you know, they can shoot films for us or write films for us or whatever. What can filmmakers learn from the app world? Metrics. I think uh, the incredible amount of data and metrics that uh, go into engineering an app and how targeted and focused it is for a very specific audience. Uh, I, I think that's what filmmakers can take away from the app world. What that opens the door to is, you know, the genre conventions I write about in writing for the green light are, are good on a, a grand scale, but some people want to produce a documentary that's very focused on a, a touchy issue that's maybe only important to a very small minority of people. That's fine. They can exploit as much of that small percentage of people as possible um, if they 
focus it and target it and reach out to those individuals and communicate with them. Same thing with like faith-based content. You know, there's a, there's a great audience out there and the stuff that sometimes gets produced on a, on a grand scale isn't hitting the nail on the head the way that audience wants it. And so they can kind of do it themselves. It's, I think what we can learn from the app world is how much data we have and how many of the answers we already all have in our pockets or purses. And just with the app world beta testing something, can a filmmaker really do that with their movie? It's tough to beta test a movie. Um, beta testing is, is, I think, much better at platforms and, and audience response. Uh, and because of that, once you kind of make a movie, it's sort of one and done. Um, and it's either going to resonate or it's not. So you can take as many steps as possible to enhance the ability for an audience to be receptive of it. Um, but it's a thing where you kind of got to know the audience in advance. And that's why the distribution assembly line kind of works the way it does, where it's all reversed engineering. It starts with the audience and builds back to what movie should be produced versus producing a movie and then just hoping for the best that it gets to the right audience. When a filmmaker is making their movie, what should they keep in mind regarding making it and making sure that they get a distribution deal? Are there things that they should target making the film, changing certain scenes that they know that distributors are going to want? Let's suppose they have their goldmine genre, they realize what they're making and who that audience might be, but in terms of securing a distribution deal, are there certain things they should be aware of in making the film? There are. A lot of them aren't the obvious things in the sense of filmmakers for the most part tend to focus on the movie, the movie, the movie. And some of them, the more astute ones, will definitely put some time into trying to find a name talent to put into the film. Um, but there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of other details that go into the delivery process of getting a movie to a distributor that become very important. Having all your agreements in place with your talent, having all you know locations cleared, having uh, you know copyrights to everything, but also having things like music cue sheets, transcripts. There's a lot of these fine details that are in uh, what are called material delivery lists, um, which are basically when you sign your movie over all the stuff you have to give to the distributors so that they can extrapolate and make any, create, you know, any, any type of file spec that any buyer in the world might want. You have to be able to give that to them so that they're not incurring any costs on that back end. That's really your job as a producer. The old vision is, you know, the uh, El Mariachi, you know, I can make a movie for seven, eight thousand dollars and sell it. And while that's true that that sort of happened, it was also a long time ago. And more importantly, the company that bought it had to invest a lot of money in finishing it and completing it and getting the audio fixed and getting the image fixed and a lot of that stuff to make it market ready. Companies aren't willing to do that anymore because the model of supply and demand, there's a ton of supply and there's focused demand. So maybe if you nail that demand, they'll help you out a bit, but it's not going to be much. And so you really have to be you know, aware of what's your responsibility to cover. And there's a lot of great resources on it if you just Google around. So music cue sheets and transcription. So with the transcription, is someone just transcribing it to English and then they're taking that file and then it can be easily done into any other language? Correct. Like, okay. like in addition to that, so it's like it's not the shooting script. It's actually the verbatim word for word what is said. But more importantly, there's time code on the page. So you have a ballpark of what time in the movie it's being said. And that's for subtitling so that when they translate all those subtitles, all those cues, they know about where it's supposed to hit in the movie when they're creating it. There's also things like when you're doing the audio mix, doing what they call M&E tracks, where you separate out, you have your stereo mixed tracks, and then you have these other two tracks that are all of the sounds and music of a movie, but if you're watching it and you just have those two audio tracks playing, every single time somebody speaks, their mouth moves and no words come out. That's because the, we've wiped out all the audio, and the reason is so when you dub it in a foreign language, they only dub the audio, the, the verbal. They don't have to dub the whole movie and remix the whole movie. They just dump in the, the voice. Interesting. Okay. So you've got to make it ready for that kind of stuff, that kind of thinking, because that's the way distributors think.
Right. And then the music uh, cue sheet, what would that be about? A music cue sheet is a lot of broadcasters internationally. Um, every single time a music piece is used that's affiliated with, you know, BMI ASCAP or one of the, you know, uh, the whatever you call them, the union, so to speak, um, that the artist is uh, given their fair share of the royalty because their music is being used to sell a product. Ah, okay. So these, these are all, a lot of it's legal, a lot of it's documentation, a lot of it's just stuff that you kind of have to showcase, uh, again, not to protect, well, you should have it to protect you when you're making the movie, but also to protect the distributor so that they know they can engage with your project in the marketplace and they're not going to have any issues later on.